with the story for the Modlins? Lots to talk about here. Well, I think that it's about the uh, the stories we don't necessarily think about. You know, the uh, to a certain extent. I mean, here's this guy who was a uh, an extra in this really big movie that no one ever thinks about. His name didn't even appear in the credits, and yet he has this whole whole uh, backstory back and uh, history that. Uh, that we don't know about it, and I thought it was fascinating. I thought it was sort of an interesting play on the whole paparazzi scene. From I mean, we see pictures of Brad Pitt and all the big stars, but you know, why are we so fascinated in their life? And here's someone who's sort of a bit player, and you know, we're looking at his whole life and the whole life of the family through photos and in that sort of paparazzi sort of way. So I thought it was quite clever. And, Cool. Yeah, I guess it's the story of the never was. It's, it's uh, kind of I, there, there was a nice chill in the air while this film was going on. It seems like everybody was very focused and very into this film. You can kind of feel the energy. I, I enjoyed it thoroughly, and I thought it was uh, kind of symbolic of life. In that you know we kind of get our 50 minutes of fame, which is this guy did very 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 briefly. Yeah. I'll get a little bit late, and then. Um, in this particular family, <clears throat> they they had they did their own thing, but they were they were very shut out from the rest of the world, and that's what we sometimes do, right? We get into our life and just don't recognize what else is going on in the world. That's what these people did: just focus on themselves, looked at their own lives, and that's they just stayed there. And that's that was their life, and we do that sometimes too. And that's that can be like so nice symbolism of uh, Rosemary's Baby, about a story about an actor selling himself to the devil. Or Spain. Go ahead. Um, I thought it was really interesting that she worked her whole life, and that was such a big deal to make that sculpture with the, the two heads. And at the end, it was just sitting in that empty yeah. apartment, like no one had ever even seen it. It didn't, you know, get used for the purpose it was intended. Yet that little role he had in the movie, like you know, made this whole movie happen in a way. I thought that was kind of cool. Margaret works at the other end of the living room. She only paints with artificial light and requires absolute silence while she works. From this position, she dominates family life, in which everything revolves around her creative obsession. Elmer soon learns to refer to her as the greatest painter of the apocalypse of all time. It's the unfortunate part about people, creative people in general, like, uh, the, the good analogy is that there is, like, in, in Brooklyn, I remember going to Brooklyn, and there was this ballpark where all these, like, People try to make it into the major leagues playing baseball, and they're all bitter, and they're still playing baseball. And it just—it was like a good analogy to like thousands and thousands of people trying to follow their dream, going after their dream, and they don't succeed because there's only a certain amount of people who can be at the top. And it's just—and then but there's that idealism of being an artist or creative person in general, where you're pushing and you think that you're great or whatever. That everybody, especially when you're an artist, you think that when you die you're going to be remembered, you're trying to leave your legacy behind, but there's really, besides this movie, which is the irony, there's no legacy for these people. The film itself, I think it was a tragedy, but the fact is that um, it doesn't really have to end like that for creative people. I think they were at the wrong time, because they found, um, I think that their passion, whatever it is, their creative passion, but nobody else was there to, uh, to witness that. So I think they were a victim of that. But the film, from a filmmaker perspective, it reminded me of something that Tarantino said, that we don't have that much of a good storytelling anymore in the um, film industry. And this was great, because this was a great story with a minimum uh, everything. And I think everyone got involved with it, so that's a good lesson to learn. For this particular movie, I thought that it was for the family, it was um, especially the lady, it was her suppression of her religious sort of beliefs and her projection of that. So, you know, at the same time, she felt like she was, you know, her religion was controlling her actions, and through that, you can see how she was controlling her family um, in the same sort of way. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's true. Like, kind of like a god complex, basically. Exactly. Uh, what I found interesting was, you know, how he laid it out in the very beginning that he came across these photographs. So it was all by chance. 
and he created the story from these photographs. So even though it was portrayed in a documentary and to be true, uh, really it was his perception of what he got out of those photographs and maybe a bit of research of who these people were. But basically he created that story and we don't really know how much of it is true or how much of it is false or, or how much is created in his own imagination. Yeah, 100%, and that's generally how every documentary is. You research, you come up with a theme, what you want, what you want to talk about, and you bring in facts, and then of course you bring in your own subjective art into into the documentary, which is great. Like it's just a, it's like this kind of a chilling ending to the film, where it's like this is a lady. You were talking about the God complex, who is an artist who like it's one, it's like failure 101 of a creative person where. They try to do these grandiose themes about life or death and these huge things, and they're they're trying to tell two or three things at the same time in all the pieces of art. And generally speaking, it's just too much. Like even the art, for, from my subjective opinion, was like too much to even look at because she was just trying to give us so much information in one piece of art, and, and unfortunately, that was a failure of her. But that was just my opinion. I don't know if the audience is familiar with. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Shenan City in New York. With, yeah, 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 with, with um, Philip Seymour Hoffman. This kind of reminded me of that with the creative type being stuck like in a vacuum where they're spending their whole life trying to actualize something and it, it like shows like, like I guess the dark side of maybe chasing your dreams. Yeah. But I think this woman like, she was turning simple math into algebra. Yeah. You know, like she could have just like taken her art somewhere and maybe tried to get people to see things and and whatnot, but instead she just like became a shut in and, and that was probably, you know, that contributed to her demise and and the, the disintegration of like her family structure and stuff like that, so. Well, that's a great point, because it's basically, if anybody sees that movie, Connected in New York, it's about being buried, it's like being, it's like going into a tunnel and not being able to get out of the tunnel. So yeah, it's kind of the same kind of analogy.